it on out, laugh and eagerly in the sunbeam, ride it on out, laugh for you were. Bernard, a.k.a. Barney Sumner, was born in 1956 in Broughton, Salford, a suburb within Greater Manchester, England. He became interested in music after hearing Ride a White Swan by T-Rex on the radio, and would subsequently be intrigued by the sonic achievements of Jimi Hendrix. Barney also recollected loving Neil Young's Harvest record and the scores of Ennio Morricone. After spending three years working for an animation company, he found his true passion in playing the guitar. Peter Hook, aka Hooky, was born in 1956 in Broughton, Salford. In his early days, Peter found great enjoyment in watching Top of the Pops, introducing him to Black Sabbath, David Bowie, and Deep Purple. He has also cited the song Sebastian by Cockney Rebel as a major influence, even attributing his success to the influence of Steve Harley. A self-proclaimed skinhead, Peter also took an interest in reggae music, presumably after spending part of his childhood in Jamaica. Stephen Morris was born in 1957 in Macclesfield, Cheshire, England. He took up playing the drums around the age of 16 or 17. This was because his school friends, who wanted to be in a band, all played the guitar, so Stephen began taking drumming lessons. His musical influences include Mo Tucker of the Velvet Underground, Yaki Liebitzeit of Can, and John French of Captain Beefheart's Magic Band. Despite strong disapproval from his parents, Stephen would spend the next few years practicing and auditioning. Amazing. Ian Curtis was born in 1956 in Stretford, Trafford, but spent his formative years in Macclesfield. Despite sharing a hometown with Stephen Morris, their paths wouldn't cross until years later. From an early age, Ian harbored a fascination for fame and the glorious side of life that seemed worlds away from the mundane confines of Macclesfield. His teenage years were often spent secluded in his bedroom, with a select group of friends spinning the records of David Bowie, The Velvet Underground, and The Doors. Ian held a particular fixation on Bowie's album Low. He was often described as possessing a rebellious and enigmatic aura. People wanted to be included in his friend circle because he was different. Even in his teenage years, Ian showed signs of self-destructive behavior. During his school service work, which involved visiting elder people, he regularly stole prescription drugs for himself and his friends to consume. Ian's substance abuse eventually led to an overdose of Largactyl at the tender age of 16. Alongside his burgeoning interest in music, poetry, and philosophy, Ian began to romanticize the idea of dying young, developing an obsession with stars that had suffered the fate of an early death. Despite being a successful student, Ian never showed interest in pursuing an academic career. Instead, after abandoning his studies, he found employment at a record store and later within civil service, a job that he maintained long into Joy Division's career. It's 1976, and the first wave of punk rock is emerging in the UK. Those Sex Pistols at this point hadn't had any releases in their name. Their early gigs and appearances in NME develops them a cult following. Iconoclastic, nihilistic, and deliberately shocking, Sex Pistols greatly resonated with British youth. Unlike rock gods like Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd, who appeared larger than life, punk rock embodied much more of a working class spirit. In the summer of that year, Sex Pistols made their way up to Northern England for a series of performances. Among these gigs was a show in Manchester that in no small part awakened a new music scene in the area. There were only about 40 people in the audience of the night of June 4, 1976, but it's remarkable just how many would go on to have successful music careers in their own right. Such attendees included future Buzzcocks Howard DeVoto and Peter Shelley, future Smiths frontman Stephen Patrick Morrissey, and school friends Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook. The show was so deliberately loud, distorted, and gritty that one couldn't even discern which songs Sex Pistols were playing. Then there was the frontman, Johnny Rotten, a man with a homicidal look in his eyes that invoked a sense of terror. This Sex Pistols gig was one of the most important moments for the future members of Joy Division. The prospect of being a rock star suddenly seemed attainable, even for a young punk in Manchester. Barney and Peter would form Stiffkin soon after the Sex Pistols show on June 4th. With Barney on guitar and Peter on bass, the hunt began for a vocalist and drummer. As a couple of aspiring punk musicians, the goal wasn't to find good musicians to fill these roles. Rather, it was to find the right kind of bad. They were able to find a guy by the name of Terry Mason to play the drums, leading to three quarters of a complete punk rock band. Throughout the same time, the members of Stiffkins continued frequenting Sex Pistols shows in the area. It was at the third gig that Barney and Peter saw a man wearing a jacket with the word hate written on it in bright orange. Perhaps it was the shocking simplicity of this outfit that started the friendship between Barney, Peter, and Ian Curtis. The 
The bands never properly adopted the name Stiff Kittens, with Ian Curtis in particular despising it for sounding just like any other punk band. On a quest for a name that felt more aligned with their vision, they eventually settled on Warsaw, a reference to David Bowie's iconic song Warsawa. After meeting Buzzcock singer Pete Shelley, Warsaw was offered a show as a support act for the band. Shortly before the gig, which took place on May 29, 1977 at the Electric Circus in Manchester, the newly named group was suddenly left without a drummer as Mason had left the band. He was replaced by Tony Tabak only two days before the show. Warsaw's first appearance was covered in national music magazines, and even though the reviews weren't entirely favorable, they did provide them with the exposure that they had dreamt of. Warsaw was now in the spotlight. Following their exhilarating debut, the second gig arrived, supporting the Heartbreakers, a band that they had never heard of. Unfortunately, the Heartbreakers turned out to be a wasted bunch of heroin addicts, wasting four hours on the sound check in a semi-coma and delivering their performance in an equally lethargic manner. Warsaw was disheartened by their carelessness, which starkly contrasted their excitement. Needless to say, lacking a sound check and facing an already riled crowd, that second gig wouldn't quite live up to their expectations. However, as more shows followed, word was beginning to spread about Warsaw. A new wave of punk was beginning to merge in the Manchester scene, and Warsaw felt like they were finally beginning to be part of something. Tony didn't last in the band for too long though. He was soon replaced by a guy named Steve Brotherdale, but they weren't pleased with his drumming, nor did they seem to have much chemistry on a personal level. Warsaw continued playing shows around the area, with one particular incident standing out. Playing at Rafters in June 1977, Warsaw got into a feud with a band called Fast Breeders over who would headline. After a heated exchange involving both bands and their managers, it was settled that Warsaw would headline. However, Fast Breeders showed up so late for the set that by the time Warsaw finally took the stage, most of the audience had already left. This evening revealed a side of Ian that the bandmates had never witnessed before, partly because he was so pissed, and partly because he might have been a bit too inspired by his idol Iggy Pop's antics, mid-set, he stormed off stage and in a fit of blind rage started smashing tables, showering everybody in broken glass, and injuring himself in the process. In the summer of 1977, Warsaw went to Pennine's sound studio for the first demo sessions. Due to budget constraints, all five tracks were recorded in a single take. The entire session didn't even take more than a few hours. At this point, Warsaw had yet to develop their sound. Peter Hook would later recall their early efforts as lackluster and too reminiscent of bands like Buzzcocks. After sending out copies of their demo tapes, they were disillusioned by the fact that no one wanted to book them. Upon listening to the demos themselves though, they were mortified to discover that their manager Terry had apparently recorded the tape while watching TV, as in one point you can hear the intro of Coronation Street playing in the background, along with his mom offering him some tea. Consequently, Terry was demoted from manager to head roadie instead, and Warsaw pretty much became their own manager. This first demo would remain the only record to feature Steve Brotherdale. He ditched Warsaw and went to play with another punk band, The Panic, instead. Once again, Warsaw had to place ads for a new drummer, and coincidentally it was in a music store in Macclesfield that a guy named Stephen Morris saw it. After hearing his audition, all three of the band members were blown away. They immediately knew he was the one. Steve's playing combined the experience of years he played in a jazz band with elements of rock and punk. All of a sudden, Warsaw had one of the most signature rhythm sections in the scene. While Warsaw inarguably had a strong harmony as bandmates and songwriters, their distinctly different personalities often caused somewhat of an immediate tension among them. Ian, who appeared the most passionate about pushing the band forward, was also the one who glued them together on a personal level. Despite being part of the Manchester's Musics Collective, they never really made friends with others in the business either. However, with Steve as their new drummer, Warsaw finally started to break out of their zone, playing shows outside of Manchester. This included an infamous gig where they ended up in front of an audience full of skinheads who threw beer bottles at them while they were playing. While Warsaw continued to share stages with bands like Slaughter and the Dogs or the Drones, it was hard to ignore the fact that other bands in their era were outshining them in terms of their success, which fueled a growing frustration within the band. Here, 
By the end of 1977, feeling stalled in their career, Warsaw decided it was time to release a proper record. In true punk spirit, the funds to produce their debut EP, An Ideal for Living, was scraped together by the band themselves, with Ian borrowing money from the bank while telling his wife Debbie it was for furniture. Gathering at Penine Sound Studios in Oldham again, the band managed to record their entire EP in just a day. Those early, fast-paced, and rather aggressive tracks were still firmly rooted in punk, in contrast to the post-punk sounds that they would later adopt. Ian seemed to have found his footing in lyricism at this point. After riffs had been written in the studio, he would go home and write lyrics to them, or draw inspiration from notes scribbled on the scraps of paper he habitually carried with him. Despite what felt like a successful recording session, the band discovered that they had made a fatal mistake only after hearing the already pressed vinyl. Featuring four songs in total, the EP was nearly double the length of a standard 7-inch, resulting in extremely low sound quality. They were utterly demoralized and pissed at their sound engineer, but with debts to repay, they had no choice but to release the abysmally sounding record anyway. As Warsaw began calling venues to book more gigs, a new problem became evident. A new band had emerged in London called Warsaw Pact, and it was creating confusion among venue owners. Even though Warsaw had formed before Warsaw Pact, the latter was finding considerable more success. Consequently, when the Warsaw bandmates attempted to book a gig, the venue managers would hang up on them when they found out they were different from the London group. It was time for a second name change, and this time it came from the novella House of Dolls. Ian had taken a liking to the 1953 book, going as far as to directly quote it in the aforementioned An Ideal for Living. The novella takes place during the horrors of the Holocaust, depicting Jewish women who were sexually abused by Nazi soldiers. These groups of women were known as Joy Divisions, and this became the new name of the band. Joy Division would be haunted by accusations of Nazi sympathies in interviews, something they've repeatedly and vehemently denied. After all, to be punk is to be shocking, and naming a band after one of the most egregious events of the 20th century certainly fulfills that expectation. It didn't help that the cover of An Ideal for Living had a Hitler youth banging on a drum on its cover. One of the first reviews of the album came from Sounds, who described it as another fascist record for fun and profit. Despite the controversy, Joy Division continued to perform and develop their sound. Around the same time as the name change, Joy Division began practicing in a rehearsal building called TJ Davidson. The now iconic venue located on Little Peter Street, Manchester, was little known at the time. In fact, Joy Division became one of the first bands to practice there, and TJ Davidson would be their main rehearsal venue for the rest of their time together. They were seeing varying amounts of success regarding live shows. Their New Year's Eve 1977 show was an early victory for the group, with decent compensation and a large audience. However, even by early 1978, there were shows where nobody would show up. It was now April 1978, and the band saw a huge opportunity to get their name out. A battle of the band's competition called Stiff Test Chiswick Challenge was coming to Manchester. 17 bands would go on to perform that night, with Joy Division being dead last on the list. While most of the audience was gone by the time they performed at 2am, luckily two key figures stuck around. One of these men was the television host Tony Wilson, who was locally known for his So It Goes music show. Ian had reportedly berated him earlier that evening for not having Joy Division on his show. The other man was Rob Gretton, the previous manager of Slaughter and the Dogs. Both men were astonished by Joy Division's performance, and Rob requested to become the new manager of the band. Having Rob around as a negotiator for the band was extremely beneficial for the group. He knew how to get gigs booked, and was able to re-release the Ideal for Living EP with a less controversial cover. Rob Rob also just meshed well with the group, who appreciated his straight-talking style and relentless drive to grow their profile. Although he could be a bit intimidating at times, Rob was exactly what the band needed at the time. With a new manager handling all the dirty work, Joy Division had more time to focus on songwriting. Joy Division was approached by John Anderson, a producer from RCA Records. They signed to his label to create their first studio album. At last, they would have the opportunity to create their debut studio album, or so it seemed. Eleven tracks were recorded in Arrow Studios in May 1978. This included Warsaw from An Ideal for Living and Shadowplay. When the band heard the tapes though, they were thoroughly disappointed. Their artistic vision was completely at odds with what John Anderson produced. It was too clean and overproduced, nothing like the noisy rawness of a group trying to Sound like the Velvet Underground. When John's solution to the band's dissatisfaction was to add background singers, the group knew it was time to drop RCA Records. The album was cancelled, and the band was again without a label.
Though the band's short time at RCA Records was less than ideal, it reflected the fact that the band was developing their own unique sound and style. Joy Division was going to play the music they wanted to play. Dropping RCA Records freed the band from any attempts to impede on their artistic vision, and it was around that time that the group was finding their voice, both figuratively and literally. Ian was now singing in his iconic dark baritone voice, which is noticeably absent in the An Ideal for Living EP. Peter's playing was becoming increasingly melodic, famously playing the highest notes on his bass guitar. The band was also playing more gigs to larger audiences. Peter would recall in his autobiography a time in which the band was doing a sound check before the show. To prepare, they played Transmission live for the first time. People began turning their heads, appearing surprised and captivated by their music. It was at this moment Joy Division realized that they had created something special. For Ian, being a frontman of a burgeoning rock group was just one half of his identity. He was also a husband, and soon to be father after Debbie became pregnant in mid-1978. These two roles he was to fulfill would become increasingly conflicted over the next two years. To the center of the city where a rose meet waiting for you. September 20th, 1978, Joy Division made their first television appearance on Granada Reports, hosted by Tony Wilson. Apparently Ian's confrontation with Tony five months earlier about not being invited onto So It Goes had worked. Performing Shadow Play, Joy Division's first television appearance is eerie and deliberately a bit awkward. Their strange stage presence can be observed in their clean-cut appearance and Ian's bizarre dancing. Peter's hair is dyed blonde in this footage. What's funny about this is that his bandmates tricked him into dyeing his hair after convincing him it was going to be the new look for the band. I think this goes to show that despite all the darkness shrouding Joy Division's music, there are still moments of humor and pranks. Now, Tony Wilson is a particularly important contributor to the band's success for a few reasons. Not only did he facilitate Joy Division's first television appearance, but he was also the co-founder of Factory Records, along with a guy by the name of Alan Erasmus. Factory Records was an independent label in Manchester. A month after their appearance on Granada Reports, Joy Division would be among the first groups to record under the label. They would contribute two songs to a Factory sample, a double EP funded by a small inheritance that Tony had received. The two tracks were digital and glass, and they were on the A side of the release. The other acts to appear on a Factory sample, in order of their appearance, are the Derudi Column, John Dowie, and Cabaret Voltaire. After a session with Factory Records, Joy Division would officially join the roster. Being an independent label, this time the group didn't have to worry about some label executive trying to commercialize their sound. Joy Division's first gig in London in December 1978 was ill-fated in many ways. The venue, a cold and damp basement, proved particularly inconvenient for Bernard, who was battling the flu. Not more than 20 people showed up, the reviews were bad, and it ended up costing them more money than they earned. Adding to the night's nice woes, Ian experienced his first epileptic seizure on his way back to London. When he suddenly started lashing out after getting into a fight with Bernard over borrowing his sleeping bag, it was at first mistaken as one of his usual weird antics by the other guys, but things turned out to be a lot more serious. Ian was hospitalized immediately and diagnosed with epilepsy the following month after suffering three to four seizures a week. The medications he was prescribed came with myriad side effects, and none of them appeared to alleviate his condition. Moreover, Ian was reluctant to change his lifestyle, which included heavy smoking, drinking, and a frequent lack of sleep. But while Ian's health deteriorated, Joy Division's musical career was starting to take off. Now at the height of their success, Joy Division refused to slow down. They embarked on increasingly larger tours while still juggling their daytime jobs. This proved to be extremely exhausting for all the band members, but particularly for Ian. Now a father to the newborn Natalie Curtis, he was a husband, parent, and bandmate. His epilepsy medications often brought on mood swings, and the strobe lights used at some shows would trigger epileptic fits. Perhaps as a means to regaining control, Ian's stage presence became more expressive, with his iconic frantic style of dancing, his arms wildly flailing, almost mimicking his epileptic seizures. Joy Division was so eager to get the word spread about them that they never turned down any offers to perform, whether it was gigs or recording sessions with John Peel or BBC Radio. Their relentless drive seemed to be paying off as their success and publicity were now skyrocketing. Many of Joy Division's most recognized songs were born during this period. Their sound continued to evolve 
evolve. While drawing influences from bands like Kraftwerk or The Velvet Underground, they always managed to transform them into something entirely their own. Simultaneously, their lyrics grew even darker and more aggressive. Tracks like She's Lost Control, depicting a woman dying of an epileptic seizure, were obviously based on Ian's very personal emotions and experiences. When it came time to make their first studio album, Joy Division found themselves at a bit of a crossroads. It had to be decided whether they wanted to create it at Factory Records in Manchester or Genetic Studios in Berkshire. Both studios had their perks, with Factory offering more creative freedom but no advance, while Genetic offered a cash advance but less creative control. Joy Division ultimately chose to record in Manchester, meaning they would have to continue working their day jobs while squeezing in weekend sessions. They became reacquainted with Martin Hannett, a producer with whom they had recorded a factory sample. Martin was an unhinged genius. He was extremely dedicated to his craft, a master of manipulating and looping sounds to create atmospheric textures. His production technique was unorthodox to say the least. Rather than having the band record their songs as a group, he would isolate each member of the group to play their part individually. For instance, Ian would record his vocals without the rest of the band behind him. Then there was poor Steven, who Martin made him play each part of his drum kit separately. Just imagine the amount of time that would have taken. Different colors Despite the sheer lunacy that was behind the recording of the album, the band would later recall the process going relatively smoothly. Once the sessions were finished, Martin kicked them out of the studio so he could begin mastering. Not exactly keen to having the bandmates around, he would scream, Get these fucking musicians out of here! Saying musicians like it was some kind of slur. With all the isolated tapes at his behest, Martin was able to individually refine, filter, and delay all the sounds with surgical precision. Some airs can actually be heard in the recording, but Martin Martin was able to turn them into strengths and create a very unique sound in the process. Factory Records graphic designer Peter Saville would design the iconic album cover. Reports conflict whether it was Barney or Steven who found the pulsar radio waves in an astronomy book. Regardless of who it was, Peter Saville was able to take this image and put it in front of a black background. The band loved the image. For them, it was something different from the other album covers at the time. It went against the cliché of a bunch of punks standing in front of a brick wall with their name spray painted on it. This was the perfect cover for Joy Division. Dark. Compelling and nonconformist. Unknown Pleasures was released on June 15, 1979. While it didn't exactly storm the charts in the beginning, sales slowly started picking up as interest in the album began to spread through word of mouth. It was also the band's first record to receive widespread critical acclaim from the music media. The album was praised for its unorthodox sound, which was unlike anything heard from the punk scene before. The NME hailed it as an English rock masterwork, while Sounds Magazine observed that, quote, if one was contemplating suicide, Joy Division was guaranteed to push you over the edge, alluding to its cold and depressing nature. Now, nearly half a century after its debut, the album, with its iconic Pulsar Radio wave cover, has long reached legendary status. With Joy Division hitting their peak in success, being on an indie label was starting to pay off for them. They still had all their creative freedom and were able to maintain their punk ethic. With no label executive breathing down their necks, pushing for higher sales as much as possible, or forcing them to present a certain facade during interviews, it was all about creating good music. The success of recording Unknown Pleasure fired up a new sense of confidence within the bandmates, and for good reason. They had their first national appearance on BBC Two's Something Else. Ian's iconic dancing became more pronounced, with his arms flailing like he was mimicking the epileptic seizures he experienced. With the group finding their artistic voice, they were booking more shows to larger audiences of fans. During one of their shows in London, the group would meet Belgian journalist Anik Honoré. Having moved to UK in 1979 to work at the Belgian Embassy, she would have the opportunity to see the group live later that year. While the bandmates were quite smitten with Honoré's sophisticated charm, it was ultimately Ian who won her heart. Much to the annoyance of the rest of the group, Honoré regularly accompanied them in subsequent performances. Described as a mother hen in Peter Hook's book, her proper temperament didn't mesh well with the antics of the rest of the band. Ian was becoming a bit detached from the rest of the group, influenced by Honoré's arty interests. He was spending more time at art shows and listening to groups like New. Though Ian was celibate from his seizure medications, he wasn't exactly keen on his wife finding out about his relationship with Anique.
Ian's distance from the rest of the group reached his climax when he briefly resigned after a show. It happened after a drunken Peter witnessed a fan get physically assaulted by another member of the audience. He was enraged, so he jumped into the crowd to fight the aggressor. The rest of the band wasn't much help as a fist fight ensued. To make matters worse, the person Peter was throwing punches at was the wrong guy, mistakenly fighting a fan. After the show, Ian and Peter were in a screaming match, with Peter angry that the rest of the group didn't help him, and Ian angry that his bandmate accidentally fought a fan. Ian declared he was leaving Joy Division, only to change his mind after bumping into the manager of Buzzcocks on his way out. As distressing as this incident was, there was no slowing down for the group. The group was set to open for Buzzcocks on a tour for their third studio album. They were finally able to quit their day jobs and become professional musicians. While not busy performing, some of the most legendary pranks occurred between the two groups. This included letting out a bunch of mice on Buzzcocks tour bus, setting Barney's shirt on fire, and deploying maggots while Buzzcocks performed. The band was experiencing the highs and lows of the rock and roll lifestyle, and Ian's behaviors were becoming increasingly erratic. One time on tour, he pissed all over an ashtray, and on another occasion he shaved the heads of the rest of the group. Keep in mind, this is all while Debbie was at home struggling to pay the bills. Meanwhile, on a brief break from their tour with Buzzcocks, Joy Division performed with Cabaret Voltaire in Brussels. It was also a Around this time that the group recorded Atmosphere, originally released as a limited edition French 7-inch. Upon the dawn of the 1980s, Joy Division embarked on a hectic European tour, consisting of 10 shows over 11 days. It was exhausting for the group. This fatigue only intensified Ian's seizures, causing the rest of the band to take him backstage to stop him from biting his own tongue. Much of the audience understandably watched in horror, although some were laughing and cheering, believing it to be part of the show. The demanding touring schedule became so stressful that Ian at one point cut himself with a kitchen knife. When the rest of the band tried to speak with him about this though, he reportedly downplayed the act of self-harm. Anik, who was present throughout the tour, provided a motherly role to Ian. Although the rest of the group found her intrusive and meddlesome, she may have been one of the only positive parts of Ian's life at this point. To add to their growing list of achievements, Joy Division was officially scheduled to tour in North America in spring 1980. The band was ecstatic that they had broken into the US and Canada, as few English bands ever had the opportunity to bring their music overseas. Although Ian appeared just as excited as the rest of the group, his life at home was becoming tumultuous. Arguments between him and Debbie were increasing in severity, one of which involved her smashing a copy of David Bowie's Low Vinyl. He admitted to his affair with Anik and insisted that he would stop talking to her. Then there were his seizures, still getting worse. Despite the worrying signs from Ian, the band played on and was growing more popular than ever before. When In June 1980, Joy Division released Love Will Tear Us Apart, the one song that might arguably become their magnum opus, their most enduring legacy. It tells the story of a couple's relationship slowly disintegrating, a narrative based on very real events for Ian, whose relationship with Debbie had pretty much completely fallen apart by this point. While this version of the track is probably the one we are most familiar with, it has already gone through several stages and transformations. Love Will Tear Us Apart dates back to November 1979, when it was first recorded for a John Peel session and quickly became a favorite at their live shows. Another session followed at Penine Studios in January 1980, but neither the band nor the producer, Martin Hannett, were happy with the result. It's a bit of a funny coincidence that the version everybody ended up pleased with was recorded at Strawberry Studios, Stockport, in March 1980. The same studio where Neil Sadaka created the hit song Love Will Keep Us Together seven years prior. By this point, the band had probably reluctantly gotten used to Martin Hannett's studio habits. As usual, he would stay in there until the early hours of the morning to work on the mixing and call them in the middle of the night whenever he felt like something needed to be re-recorded. And this wouldn't be the last time this strange symbiosis between Hannett and the band would result in a masterpiece. <laughs> Fast 
For their second album, Closer, the decision was made to leave Manchester and record in Britannia Row Studios in London. The studio, originally built by English rock band Pink Floyd, was state-of-the-art at the time, and it came with a huge perk to Ian. Being far away from home allowed him to spend time with Anik pretty much 24-7, again much to the annoyance of his bandmates who felt that Ian was more interested in going to art shows than recording. Once again, there was a tension brewing within the band. Martin Hannett joined in again as the producer, and while proving to be equally difficult to work with, as during the sessions of Love Will Tear Us Apart and Unknown Pleasures, there was again, no doubt, this guy was a creative genius. Martin introduced the band to synthesizers and sequencers, elements that would become especially prominent in later songs like Isolation, Heart and Soul, or Decades. He was obsessed with achieving a clear sound, often having the band record their instruments during the day while Ian sang alibi vocals over them. Ian would then come back to the studio to re-record his vocals at night to avoid any sort of background noise. The history of Unknown Pleasures repeated itself as the band ended up not being pleased with the production of Closer. Bernard and Peter, in particular, totally hated it. They had wanted a heavier album, and felt like its harshness and abrasiveness had been lost in the mix. Despite their reservations, Martin's production would later be praised by critics, and Closer was widely acclaimed as a gothic rock masterpiece, receiving even more positive recognition than its predecessor. Closer was released on July 18, 1980, two months after Ian Curtis had committed suicide. Ian's death sheds a different light on Closer's lyrics. While the lyrics on Closer were even darker and more personal than those on Unknown Pleasures, they now almost sound like a soundtrack to Ian's suffering. This left his bandmates and Ian's wife Debbie, who hadn't read the lyrics until after Ian's passing, wondering if they had unwittingly foreshadowed his imminent death. Even the album's cover, depicting a photograph of a family tomb in Genoa's monumental cemetery in Stagliano, taken by Bernard Pierre Wolf in 1978, seemed eerily prophetic in retrospect. Suffice it to say that given the circumstances, there was some concern about having a funeral theme on the cover, but the band ultimately decided to stick with it. Following the recording of Closer, Joy Division was on the cusp of their North American tour. To have ample funds to travel overseas, the group played some additional shows in the UK. In typical Joy Division fashion, the group kept moving forward, feeling the pressure to deliver to the massive audience they had grown. Ian, who was already very ill during the recording of Closer, would be hospitalized after a suicide attempt. However, he insisted he was okay afterwards, and the band continued their performances. One particular show in Derby Hall became particularly notorious for what ensued. The band was playing to an audience of approximately 400, the max capacity of the venue. Things went to chaos when an additional 200 students managed to sneak in through the fire exit. Just two days after Ian's suicide attempt, the group opted to have Alan Hempsall from Crispy Ambulance to stand in. Despite the swollen crowd size, everything was going okay until Ian unexpectedly showed up at the event and stepped in halfway through the set. This led to confusion and anger from the audience, many of whom appeared unaware that the former singer wasn't the real Ian. Pints of alcohol were thrown, Twinnie the roadie was bloodied up, and an enraged Peter had to be restrained in the dressing room. The venue was totaled. Debbie would attend one of Joy Division's final shows. It was there that she would discover more about the nature of Ian and Anique's relationship. After the show, she called Ian screaming that she would file for a divorce. Without a home to return to, Ian would stay with various friends and family members. Around the same time, he would say goodbye to Anique, who was leaving for Egypt on holiday. Two songs would be recorded while this was taking place, Ceremony and In a Lonely Place. In April 1980, a promo video for Love Will Tear Us Apart was filmed, the only one that they would ever make. Joy Division actually hated the idea of filming a music video. They all agreed that lip syncing and mimicking playing their instruments went against their core principles as musicians. However, as TV representation became increasingly important for a band's success, they eventually found there was no real way around it. As a compromise, it was decided that instead of just miming the song, the band would perform it live and it would be filmed. Equipment was set up at TJ Davidson's studio, a familiar rehearsal place from the early days of the band, and a live version of Love Will Tear Us Apart was filmed. Not surprisingly, as the location wasn't set up for a live recording, the quality ended up being abysmal and the video barely got any airplay. To the band's surprise, the only place where the video was rather successful was Australia. Australian TV editors had overlaid footage of their live performance with the studio 
video version of Level Tear Us Apart. It was out of sync and the visual quality was poor, but it would remain the official version of the video until it was remastered in 1995. With concerns about Ian's worsening condition growing, the band finally began to scale back their performances and take things slower. To this day, it remains unclear to his bandmates whether Ian truly wanted to go to America. While he appeared to be brimming with excitement about the upcoming tour around them, other reports claimed he would rather die than go to America. The fact is, Joy Division never made it to that tour. On the evening of May 17, 1980, Ian returned to his home in Macclesfield, where his wife and daughter were. Despite Debbie's insistence on divorcing Ian, she offered to spend the night at his side to watch for seizures, but Ian declined. He spent that last night alone, watching the Werner Herzog film Strotzek and listening to Iggy Pop. When Debbie returned the following morning, she found that her husband had hanged himself. The record The Idiot named after Dostoevsky's novel about an epileptic prince, was still turning. Those close to Ian would later speculate that it was most likely a combination of his deteriorating health and failed marriage that drove him into a steep downward spiral, ultimately leading to death. In a way, he now had met the same tragic fate as all the short-lived rock stars that he adored and idolized throughout his entire life. Cry like a child, though these years make me older. Ian's greatest legacy, the lyrics he had written for Joy Division, began to appear in a different light. What had been seen as mere poetry, an artistic expression detached from reality by most people around him, now seemed to tell a more personal story that grew darker and darker as time progressed. In light of recent events, Joy Division's popularity was suddenly skyrocketing, but none of the band members bothered reading the articles that were flooding the music magazines. Each of them was individually processing the loss of Ian, and barely even talked about it. Joy Division had very much been the sum of its parts, and early in their career, they had made a pact that if any member left, it would mean the end of the band. Peter, Steve, and Bernard kept that promise. One of the final tracks collectively written by the band was Ceremony. Despite being composed shortly before Ian's death, it sounds almost strangely upbeat for a Joy Division song. Although Ian wrote the lyrics, no high quality recording of him singing it exists. Therefore, Bernard Sumner took over the role as the singer. While 1980 marked the end of Joy Division, the remaining members continued to write music history in a band named New Order, a story that probably deserves its own documentary. Their debut single, Ceremony, alongside the B-side in a lonely place seems like the perfect transition between the two bands. It's easy to forget how short-lived Joy Division was as a band. They might be one of the prime examples of bands whose impact only truly unfolded in the decades after they disbanded. Artists, not only from post-punk and gothic rock, but from a wide array of genres, many born long after Joy Division's time still cite them as a primary influence. Their legacy is eternal, with grainy 70s TV recordings still flickering on our high-resolution screens over 40 years later, and the iconic radio pulsar image forever etched in our minds. As always, at the end of our journey, we would like to hear from you. What are your favorite Joy Division songs, and what are your thoughts on their story? As always, I want to give a shout out to our patrons, Andrea Leon, Craig S. Tile, Henry Hoyt, Nicholas Cabello, Jim Venaria, Hating XWX, and Clueless Clueless. Thank you all so much. And to everybody who has helped grow this channel, we appreciate you guys so much. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up and leave a comment below. Subscribe and hit the bell button if you want to see more content like this. Stay dreamy, everyone.